I'm S.A. Bradley, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror, where I remind you that you used to love horror movies, and you secretly still do. One of the many things I love about the horror genre is that it is so versatile. No matter who you are, there's a horror movie out there that will speak directly to what scares you, and it will leave its mark on you. Horror has endured throughout the centuries because we need it. It's not a social need. It's not a cultural need. It is a human need. And yet, for a long time in pop culture history, horror fandom and horror journalism were falsely considered the domain exclusive to men. Of course, passion knows no gender, and artificial walls are starting to crumble. Bela Lugosi knew the score 75 years ago when he stated that it is actually women who love horror. Scary stories feed something. Women are nourished by that dark magic. And women who love horror movies are not passive spectators. They are active participants who are compelled to create their own art and share their passion. My guests today are Kelly Gredner and Jessica Nicole, who together are known as the spinsters of horror. Now, the Spencers flew onto the horror scene in July of 2018. That means we're on a three-year anniversary. And they did that to assist in filling the void of female voices in podcasting with their show, I Spit on Your Podcast. As women, they knew that the genre was dominated by the masculine perspective, so they felt it was important to celebrate and encourage female horror fans while at the same time remaining inclusive to all who love what horror has to offer. I Spit on Your Podcast is where two metal witches discuss horror movies and sometimes other mediums with thoughtful analysis, research, and passion. It's a semi-academic show with a dash of feminism, a sprinkle of sarcasm, but rich with intrigue and a little bit of dark comedy. They also have the Spencers of Horror Coven website, and this site showcases special features like Kelly's Taboo Terrors and Let's Scare Jessica to Death and Not Your Stepford, Exploration of the Monstrous Feminine. Both Kelly and Jessica's essays and writings have been published in Grimm Magazine, Morbidly Beautiful, among others. So today, the heavy metal druid meets the Spencers of Horror. Jessica, Kelly, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh my God. Thank you for that thank incredible you. intro. Yes. yes. Thank I feel you. Like so I should stop having back. us. <laughs> well, it's, I, I'm always, I'm, a, I'm drawn towards passion. That's what always happens. And I love, so I, I had to take a look and once I start getting obsessed, it gets ridiculous really fast. And I start trying to find out everything I can. And so I, I like to start my show the same way. I don't know if either of you have really listened to the show, but I have this thing called the first kiss that I love. And what that is, is the first kiss with horror. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the movie that you love or is your favorite. It's the one that galvanized you. You couldn't sleep for three days, whatever. And instead of running from that, it brought you down this road of ruin where we sit today. So I'll start with uh, asking that question. I'll start with you, Jess, known as the witchy one and the banger of heads. So what was your first kiss with horror? My first kiss with horror, the one I can think that stayed in my mind forever was Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. Ooh. And it was the scene where he is in the bat form and he's like, he yells at, I remember seeing that scene and it terrifying me forever, but that I was intrigued. And that's when I started getting to like spooky stuff, like the supernatural, like vampires and our, the scholastic book fairs and stuff like that. Cause for <laughs> me, horror started out in the literature. I started out reading horror before I actually ventured into films. So yeah, that that's my story. That's great because uh, for me, I, I talk about the quiet revolution, which is books uh, mm. be long before I could even, I, cause I was a scaredy cat. I, I would see something I'd have nightmares for days. And so the first thing I could do was read and my dad was functionally illiterate. So he had no clue what books were going to give me. So the first sex scenes from <laughs> Jaws and the towering Inferno and the books, I was like, Oh my God, these are fantastic. And then horror. Uh, so horror was started for me through literature. And literature is still the place that I tend to go. And I tell people that's a great corruptor. People talk about TV, but the great corruptor that also allows you to learn how to communicate is uh, being able to be a good reader. Now, you mentioned that uh, it's a kind of a newfound love and passion for horror and writing, and uh, that brought you to researching and podcasting. Uh, so what brought you into it? Was it Bram Stoker or was there something else that got you to this point where you're podcasting and stuff? It was a journey for me in terms of uh, my horror journey because 
I grew up in a very heavily Catholic Roman Catholic household and like horror, the supernatural, all that stuff. Like you, you don't believe in that or you just, it doesn't exist or it's bad or it's going to influence you in some way. But I had always been interested in like the paranormal and the supernatural myself. So I, like I, like I said, I read Goosebumps and R.L. Stein and, and like you had that experience too, where like, I read Interview with a Vampire, but no one knew I was reading a horror novel or that I was reading like R.L. Stein's like cheerleader series and cheerleaders are getting slaughtered and killed and stuff like that. Like I was reading horror, but like as long as I wasn't watching it, it was okay. Um, but I was also a scaredy cat too. And I would like have nightmares. And I remember like in high school going to sleepovers and seeing scream and being terrified and like hiding because I have an overactive imagination. So it, it took years for me to really develop. Like I always knew I loved horror. I always loved the dark side of things. I'm in your manifesto. You talked about that. I'm like, yes, I identify with my, my shadow side. Um, but it took years for me to get to that place where visually I could watch it and kind of not be overcome by the imagery and be able to step back and be like, especially when it came to analyzing horror. And I was like, Oh wait, I see what's happening here. Oh, okay. I love this theme. And now like, I'm still afraid, but I'm intrigued and I want to see what happens. No, oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I love the idea that you can be reading a book on a bus. You can be in the middle of seven people being murdered and no one knows. They're just like sitting there. Yeah, it's like a, pur a perfect purgative for me. Uh, so let's go. I'm going to ask the same question to you, Kelly. You're known as the slayer of men and kiss your kittens. So what, what's your first kiss right. car? So I have been a horror fan for about 25 years, and I used to host and go to many sleepovers with my little girlfriends when I'm, you know, in elementary school and all the way, again, up till now. I love hosting those kind of like movie get togethers, but we would go to the video store and rent whatever seemed spooky based on the cover. But if you're growing up in the 90s, Jess, Jess, I think would agree with me on this, that like The Exorcist was like a rite of passage, right? Yeah. And that was a movie that terrified me to tears, okay? And I have to set the scene for you because it was perfect. So both Jess and I grew up in North Bay, Ontario, which is like a relatively smaller Northern Ontario town. And my good close friend lived out like in the woods in this nice big house out into the woods. And she had this big house and she had this library where you had to walk down a couple of stairs to get into it. And it was covered in books like, like wall, to, sorry, uh, floor to ceiling and red carpeting. But there was also two openings. There was like the normal opening we would like from the kitchen walk into. And then the other opening went into like their fancy sitting room that like nobody ever used. Mm -hmm. So we just have these openings on all, all around us with windows too. And they're out in the woods, which is already spooky. And we're watching The Exorcist for the first time. And we're screaming, we're paralyzed with fear, crying, like literal tears coming from these little girls' eyes, okay? And I mean, that is such a vivid memory of mine because, well, <laughs> it was quite right. the experience. <laughs> and so I bonded with people, with my gal friends, through horror. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about the genre is that people can really bond through it. It's such a cathartic personal experience, less like comedies or dramas or whatever else exists in the world. I don't know. I watch only horror, <laughs> um, you know, so it's it's such a wonderful genre that you can experience with other people and really just like bond through and cherish together. And I know that like I feel like Jess and I have even bonded further in our 20 plus year of friendship because of this and, mm -hmm. and our love of horror movies. Yeah. Uh that's great. I, I agree on uh, there's something about that connection that I have. I, I call it convention family. There are people that I meet at every convention. I've actually flown to a guy's house in Chicago to watch eight bad movies in a row for a turkey day, you know, sit there and just oh, yeah. he would come up with these things and just because there's this connection. I think I'll get back to this idea later in, in our conversation, but really about ritual. The idea that what we do is we kind of create ritual when we're doing mm. this. And I think film in itself does that, but horror does it on a deeper level. It's almost like the sweat lodge <laughs> of, uh, of ritual, you know, where you're going to just go through this experience. And it's going to 
really loosen the tight lips and you're going to be able to get somewhere a little bit deeper. And I love that it's the exorcist because uh, I, I grew up in a, a cult, basically. I was in a fundamentalist cult uh, that believed that the world was going to come in, to an end in 1975. And they believe demons are right here, like right now, me talking about, it, they're like poking me in the ear. And, uh, and that was terrifying to me. And so the idea of watching the exorcist, reading it first, I read it first and it gave me just nightmares beyond belief. And I couldn't let them know because it would be like they it would i was proving them right you know you're a little possessed right now uh but uh seeing it in the theater i didn't see it in the theater i saw it on hbo or whatever but the funniest story i have about that kind of bonding was actually watching it alone at a friend's house after i was recuperating from a knee injury and i uh he went to work and this was somewhere in danbury connecticut and he had an old style tv with a big clicker and uh, he had a huge old uh, top loaded VCR. And he had the old clamshell exorcist, like the first ones that came out. And so uh, that was back before they really started putting in the extra frames for the uh, the subliminal messages, because they got into trouble for subliminal work. And Mm -hmm. so there was this thing where you couldn't really see Pazuzu. Everybody knows what that face looks like now. But back then, it was just this weird flash. And so I'm watching this scene. I'm seeing this dream that the priest is having and his mom's going up and down the subway thing. And all of a sudden, there's this flash. And I go frame by frame. And all of a sudden I see that face oh. and I'm just like, never saw it before. And it's just right there. And I'm like, Oh shit. So I'm like, okay, I got to turn this off and I'm on crutches, right? My oh. knee is destroyed. I'm basically James Stewart in, in rear window. And I'm like sitting there going, okay, turn this off. The goddamn thing goes back on. So it turns back on and I'm like, ah, and I'm like, trying to (laughs) shut it off again. And it ends up, we find out later, you know, it's like those great ghost hunter things are like, well, you thought you were possessed, but it actually was the batteries were dying in this stupid thing. And it was just giving a charge, but I had no idea. I'm sitting there trying to read a book and I hear click. I hear it come back on and I look over and the TV's on this guy's gone. And so I left the house. I'm on crutches <laughs> and I'm out on the sidewalk waiting for my friend to come home because I completely freaked myself out. And this was mid eighties. So yeah, it was really, really bizarre. And I, I have a real soft spot for that film. And it's so funny me that me getting scared matters, you know, and I, I am so grateful when I see a movie that gives me a scare now, because after decades, I'm somewhat jaded about things. I can see where people are going with uh, their ideas. And it's so wonderful that there are so many people who are trying to subvert those tropes and allow for timing to be off. You mentioned, uh, I think Kelly, you mentioned comedy before. And Mm -hmm. I don't say, you know, you talk to a comedian, they'll punch you right in the face. You start saying that it has to do with timing and it's like horror. But I think that there are certain things that there are, both have an element of surprise. They live on the idea that you're going to be surprised with whatever's around the corner. uh, And there is a timing to it. And so I think it's really fun when people are smart enough to be able to get away from that timing that we all know all too well. So uh, I, uh, you mentioned that we've been friends for 20 some years. So what was the evolution? How did you evolve into a podcast and a website from being friends for a long period of time to where you are right now? Oh, well, I'll jump in first just to say that I knew that Jess was a horror fan before she knew she was a horror <laughs> fan. And like, I would like just kind of poke her a little bit and I would encourage it because I love horror and I know she's going to like it too. So let's just say what it is, like call it what it is. Right. And so early, early Jess loved like 19, like 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s horror, like old black and white stuff. Right. So I'd buy her like these big compendiums of like 100 (laughs) black and white horror movies, whatever, just so just to encourage that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of developed into her feeling a little bit more confident (laughs) and we've pretty much always had a long distance friendship as well. Like I moved away, went to college or whatever. She stayed in North Bay. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we've always been long distance. So like once a year we'd visit and she's like, okay, Kelly, one movie, I will watch one horror movie. And I was like, okay, okay. So I start with some classics, but, uh, and one of my favorite stories of that is she had come to visit me with a, a partner of hers at the time. And I lived in a basement apartment. It was all dark and I'm showing her Candyman. <laughs> and her partner at the time also was a horror fan. 
both of us fell asleep, leaving Jess to fend for herself watching Candyman for the first time. <laughs> I was <Okay>. terrified. <laughs> terrified. <laughs> Perfect time so for a power like, outage, right? Right, exactly. Oh God, good luck going to my bathroom <laughs> alone, Jess. So it's uh, it took just like some years of like encouragement and show and like I so many times we'd like sit back and I would like teach her horror movies and like mm-hmm. how they work and the tropes and the musical cues and stuff like that. So yeah. I had I single handedly helped her out. Let's just say that. <laughs> yes, she did. So yeah, so it was like building off of this tradition of. I've always enjoyed horror. Like I, it came later in life for me, um, just going through stuff with a marriage and stuff like that and kind of like looking for my identity. And I'm like, okay, I've always been into the spooky, the paranormal, the supernatural since I was a little girl. So this is how Kelly was able to like identify that. Yeah, this person is into horror. Like, how can you not be right? So I would watch these movies with Kelly and I'm like, okay, I love these ideas and these things that are coming out. And so I think I just randomly, I started listening to the faculty of horror. I was like, you know what? Cause I'm an academic myself. Like my background is in history. I have my master's and I like write academic writing. I love research and I love when people connect ideas and see something that there's more to what's being presented and then they can talk about it. And I love having conversations. So I started listening to the faculty of horror and they were Andrea and Alex, their podcast helped me to be like, wait a second, horror is really smart. (laughs) Like in the sense of like, I am relating to this and they're telling me about these ideas and these themes that are present present that I was like, now that I see that movie, I have seen it. I can see that. And I want to have conversations and be engaged in the conversation. So I like gobbled up their podcast. They recommended books. I started reading the books. I started watching more horror movies. Like I go to Kelly and be like, Hey, like what, you know, do you have a suggestion or something like that? And then I met someone at a party, another person who is uh, like a horror veteran. Um, <laughs> he was a big, big collector of horror movies. Like he was about a couple years older than me, but like really, you know, um, like on those like Arrow Video, Astron 6, like all those like mailing lists, like knew a lot about horror movies. And I was like, hey, I'm interested in doing a podcast. I, I always wanted to have my voice out there in some way, shape or form. So I was like, do you want to do a podcast with me? We do the dark spectrum, a horror veteran showing the newbie the ropes. Uh. <laughs> um, and so it would literally be us talking about different horror moves. Like he'd be showing me a, like a, a cult classic, like Life Force or, um, you know, uh, Raw Meat. I hate that one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Deathline. I Sorry. I always want to say Deathline because I don't believe in the, the Raw Meat title. But anyway, then he showed me these classics and we would talk about them. The podcast went defunct because he wanted to talk about his, experience as an adult growing up as a young man with these films and I wanted to have the more academic I wanted to have a conversation it's like what do you think about this theme of cannibalism in this film and what do you think it represents and the history behind it um so that went defunct so I was like well I still want to talk horror and I still want to have my voice out there and so I went to Kelly and I was like hey are you interested in doing this I know you don't know much about podcasts but you've been trying to listen to the dark spectrum would you want to do this with me and she said yes (laughs) And three years later, still kicking. We're yep. still going. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I think that's great. And I also love that. Uh, you know, like <laughs> you, they, you didn't know. You're the last person to know that you were a horror fan. There are so <laughs> many parts of me that I have had that revelation where everybody's like, "What are you talking about? We knew this a long time about you." <laughs> so, but uh, so as artists, because I do consider you both artists, what oh. is the appeal of the horror genre that you? wanted to express your voice you want to get your voice out that there's a million ways to do it but you decided that the elements of horror fit your voice the best so what is it about that that just came to you that made you want to do this well when Jess when Jess came to me with this idea yes I was new to podcasts but also I was very new to the relatively new to this idea of like dissecting horror from a academic point of view. I'm a vet tech. I am. I do not have a history of academia at all. I've learned a trade in my lifetime, right? And though I had like started doing some reading of, you know, articles and stuff like that, listening to Jess's podcast, because I knew I, I saw her struggling to like throw in this, like this kind of uh, perspective into the show. Um, and so I was up for a new challenge and I've always come at, and I still do, come at horror from a love of the this form of entertainment, the imagination, 
just the whole, well, the whole dark spectrum, let's say, of, of horror and what it does have to offer all the different subgenres and the creativity and the imagination and the, you know, I come from it from that point of view and I have grown to really enjoy dissecting it in a more academic sense or just thinking about horror. That's essentially what it boils down to is thinking about horror. And I'm on board with it. I've I've fallen in love with horror in a whole new way now. And I'm really, really, really happy that uh, we went on this journey together because I've learned so much. I mean, during the pandemic, I've watched like 300 movies, mainly all horror. And I can still do it for the entertainment value. I can kind of sit back and just like put this like thinking cap aside Mm -hmm. and just devour tons of horror movies. But there are those movies that kind of show themes and ideas and commentary kind of just on their sleeve and you just can't help but recognize that and then want to talk about it mm-hmm. yeah i i truly believe uh, in, in all of this uh i'm so overjoyed that there are more people who are getting into the well what does it really mean kind of side to horror because i you know i'm a little bit older uh when i i jaws and the exorcist were in the theaters when i was alive and so I may not have been able to, I saw Jaws in the theater, which scared the living shit out of me, oh but uh, I did not see The Exorcist. Uh, and at that point, I mean, this was a time when we're in the new wave of uh, movies, uh, the new age of uh, of filmmaking in the 70s, where we're getting the auteur theories really coming to the top. Filmmakers, directors are the kings and they are the true storytellers and critics are taking them seriously. And even my father, father who was not a a guy who was going to dissect films he kind of got it you know because it was so in the thread of culture we really wanted at one point it seemed like we wanted to be smart about films so it was okay to talk film theory and stuff and it was kind of out there but they didn't do it for horror movies they did it for the exorcist but even then friedkin was like it's not a horror movie you know there was all this stuff that was happening it was still considered just a little bit above porn and me being a horror fan and being a cinema fan, just loving movies and believing in the auteur theory and all of this stuff. um, I said, why can't it be for horror movies? So I always kind of looked at it at that level. And I had horror fans who thought I was an idiot because they're like, no, man, I'm just here for the gore. And I'm like, well, yeah, there's that, but there's also this other thing. And I think it was also some of my upbringing, which was very much in books and so research, 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 seeing, you know, similarities. And it's funny, you know, I don't, I love to tell people, if you really want to know what was driving a culture insane at any given time, you want to find out what was really freaking people out in America, go to the movies of the thirties of that time and look at the B movies, look at the movies. Don't look at the big ones. They're giving you the, the fantasy of what everybody wants. Look at what scares people because the horror movies as the constant exploiters, and we make exploitation sound bad, but the idea that you are actually purging the anxieties of a time. And so you watch and you see these movies that are in the thirties that are all about white slavery and all these things. You see that. And there's a reason that that's a trend. There's a reason that that's there. These guys needed to poke you in the sore spot or you weren't going to come to the movie. Didn't matter whether you were on one side or the other, those B B movies like microwave massacre and all those movies at a certain time. If you watch those, you will see what it was that people were so upset by. You can see why as feminism started getting bigger, the, uh, and people were starting to attack slash movies that they doubled down on the misogyny. You can see it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really intriguing to me, but it's funny uh, Kelly, that you mentioned that, oh, well, I, I wasn't the one who was the intellectual. I was the, the vet. <laughs> I was the vet tech. <laughs> and I'm like, the reason that I'm here is because I've been following the spinsters for a few years. And then I reached out because of an editorial that you wrote, Kelly, and it was called The Exploitation of Suffering in Midsummer and Hereditary. And when I first saw the title, I was like, oh, no, oh, please don't let this be an article that damns horror for touching on nerves. Right. That was my first thought. Difficult emotions. We can't talk about. Them. Oh, no. And then I read the thing. And I was like, oh. What a great way to get me incited by having that title. Uh, and then I'm reading it and I'm going, this is my people. You know, I, you make the case that horror has always been textually or subtextually talking about the anxieties of the day, what was, which I was just talking about. So can you discuss that a little bit? Because that was a good article. And I think you heard a lot of stuff about it. You did. 
Thank you. I did. Did I had a feeling it might ruffle some feathers or at least create some conversation, which is which is great. It just was it was something that I was developing in my mind for a good number of months because, you know, I being a horror fan for 25 years, I've seen a lot of movies indie, mainstream, I've seen a lot of movies. You know, the mainstream ones are obviously like they're easier to obtain and get access to because they're mainstream. I can go to theaters and see it, whatever. Um, And so, and I don't know if you want to get into this aspect of it, like the post-horror, the elevated horror. Of, that's, I Oh, you may know that that's one of my things. <laughs> yes, for sure. But I know that was like the third thing that you wanted to talk about. We're we're going yeah. in whatever okay. direction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm a pro. I can wheel it right around. <laughs> I need a script. I'm kidding. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that piece was kind of born out of some frustrations that I was feeling again as a horror fan for so many years, and seeing the conversation, the discourse going on, you know, Twitter and the internet and people have a lot of opinions and started reading more articles like uh, the 2017 article by Stephen Rose uh, called how post horror movies are taking over cinema. Mm -hmm. And then there was the 2018 article by Jane Hugh that's uh, called can horror movies be prestigious. Okay. And there are terms and I even just saw one recently. That was a new one. I haven't seen. Okay. So there's now this, this new terminology that's come out called post horror, prestige horror, art house horror is the one I just saw the other day on a group yeah. and elevated horror. Hmm. And art, art house horror has been around since the conjure or not the conjuring, uh, the haunting haunting was considered art house horror. The, uh, Fair enough. the, uh, what yeah. was the other one? The offspring, not the offspring, oh, turn of the screw. Bedsy? Anytime oh, they yes, redo yeah. the turn of the screw. It's always called art house <laughs> horror. Yes. So just these terms that sound to me very pretentious. Okay. And Ari Aster, which, you know, those are the two films that I focused on. Fine. I, I watched hereditary because there was big buzz. I usually kind of wait a little bit till some buzz kind of fall, like calms down a little bit. So I'm not, because I mean, it's easy to become influenced by hype and what so many people are saying. I get that. So I kind of wait a little bit. And then finally I watched it like a year later and felt it was very fine. Okay. Um, and then because everybody was ranting and raving and they love this movie so much. And then, you know, Ari Aster brought out Midsommar and... <sighs> Um, I wasn't going to see it cause I didn't, I didn't really care about it. And so I saw a couple of images and the images that I saw that somebody posted on Twitter were all of all of the grotesquerie that is in that movie. Right. And I was like, Oh, this happens in midsummer. Okay. Now I'm kind of intrigued again. I like gore and blood and entertainment and like, again, so that's what drew me in. And then it was midsummer. Okay. And I just got my, my kind of racked my brain with how are these movies any different than the last 100 plus years of horror cinema? Like that's a very like broad term, but mm-hmm. how, because everybody's like, this is different. These movies that fall into this category are different and they don't really, and people aren't, they can't really tell me how, why they're so different. And I saw somebody else on Facebook just again the other day who said art house horror said that there's been like these movies are, they've created this horror renaissance and I completely disagreed. Okay. And essentially the whole piece was about that. I think this is pretentious and horror has always been relevant and always has been wonderful and always had something to say since You know, when Todd Browning did Dracula, James Well did Frankenstein, there's always been something to say in horror. And so this isn't new. So I don't know why people are bringing up these rebranding horror because they don't want to call it horror. That's a whole different thing that we can talk about after. But horror has just always had something to say. And so I just didn't see how Midsommar and Hereditary really had anything new to say. Right. They have, uh, people don't, 
hate horror movies. They hate horror movie lovers. <laughs> they hate guys like me. They don't want to be on a bus with me. That's yeah. the problem. And they, they do want to make this distinction. And I think horror is there to let us find the line that we must draw that, okay, this is what I'm accepting. This is a little bit out there. And I feel good about my boundary because I'm able to see it right here, but there's something for everybody. And yet there is this thing of uh, changing the name. I, I, I tell people that there are many people who say that they're horror fans and they suffer from shining itis. The, the first movie that'll come out of their mouth is the shining the shining oh, is the greatest shining and i'm like <laughs> okay yeah i mean i i i watch it a lot for a movie that i i, I my problem is i get to see myself from a non-horror perspective because the it's the fans of the shining that drive me crazy because they all want to you know they want to kiss the ring of Kubrick. And because uh, Kubrick did this, it's yeah. just perfect. And it's a great movie, but mm. it is not the greatest. And it is certainly not something that can be emulated. There are so mm. many filmmakers that go, well, I could do a 15 minute shot of somebody just staring. No, you can't. Yep. No, you can't. And, <laughs> and quite honestly, Kubrick barely did it. <laughs> and and uh, it's funny because the movie was a failure when it first came out. I mean, mm. the, people were like, tr People Magazine was the only thing that gave it a good review. Everybody's like, well, this it's kind of like a near car accident, right? <laughs> You're a little nervous <laughs> afterwards, but it's not really doing anything for you. And, and King came out and anybody who was a fan of the book uh, mm. hated it because there were all yeah. these cool things like the hedge animals weren't around. And so people were like, all this stuff is what makes it good. So anyway, the long and short of it is, People want to say that they love horror and then they put that movie up there as the one thing that makes uh, it's taking it to art. And I'm like, you know, that that movie was influenced by so many other artists that were mm -hmm. out there. Robert Wise made the most artistic of horror films because you never even see a monster in the haunting. And this yes. is a movie that is just full of style in a way that has constantly so many things are stolen off of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that you sit there and go, oh, that's a trashy movie. You know, if you like uh, any kind of grit, you're going to find the grit originator inside of that movie. And so yeah. Uh, I find that the, the the same thing happens with these these films like Midsummer. People who normally don't look at they dismiss horror. They won't go see it. They get a taste of what the real juice is when they mm -hmm. see a movie like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Ari Oster's films, as soon as I saw them, I said, oh, he watches Polanski. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh. He okay. watched The Wicker Man. Yeah. He yes. saw The Wicker Man, <laughs> right? Uh, he has a little bit of a, an understanding of uh, what happens in Britain, how it doesn't make it over here. But all of these things that are in there, he watched Altman's Three Women. I mean, there are so many things that are in these movies that are from other places. And they all made me think, hooray, we're going back to the 70s films. But you can't say that to some folks because it's like, no, it's new. Sorry, yeah. this is 2020. Brand new. Therefore, it means that it's something new. And, and I'm cool with that to a point. Just do not denigrate. Don't take away the fruits that horror worked so hard. The artists of horror have worked so hard over centuries to be able to come up with a way to keep this pungent and poignant in our time period and don't throw it away by saying it's something else you know if uh, if you don't like horror movies and it's because you label other uh, horror movies something else when you don't uh, when you like them yeah it's a self-fulfilling prophecy right if you rename a, a great horror movie every time it's a great horror movie then there are no great horror movies you're just yeah. stuck yeah and it's yeah. this rebranding or reclassifying of well-produced, very well-made, well-directed, well-written films, generally speaking. Um, I just found out recently Jordan Peele's debut, Get Out, was branded as a social thriller. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, learned yeah. that happened. Uh, Parasite, as we know, that Korean film uh, yes. won some Academy Awards last year. Helmed as a black comedy. Yep. The Shape Out of Water was described as a fantasy romance and going back to the 90s, Silence of the Lambs was redefined as a psychological thriller. So we're taking away the horror label so it can be acceptable to people. And I, I say, really yeah. don't like that right. at all. It's oh. let's call it what it is. Yep. It's horror because then you're kind of saying that things that are, are called horror aren't worthy of critical acclaim. It's not worthy of this praise. Yeah. And again, I again, I love your, you know, the horror manifesto yes, that you did. Really Scott great. was like, 
horror doesn't deserve your shame. Yes. That? You know, the uh, it is so old and it really is all about uh, art versus our culture versus pop culture. There's always been this separation and everybody wants to attain the level of culture and pop culture has always been this this dirty thing. I mean, uh, The Exorcist, they were trying to come up with a different name than horror movie for it. Yep. Uh, Jaws, Roger Ebert, I think, called it an adventure story. Yeah, uh, an adventure I, movie. Yeah, I have a friend who calls it a nautical drama because of all of this. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just a nautical <laughs> drama. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> so uh, it, it's absurd. But the thing is, I think the geeks we have inherited the earth in a way uh, pop culture has now blurred the lines of where culture and pop culture used to be. I mean, when we're talking about uh, science fiction films and superhero movies and some of them being at the level of how we used to talk about the Godfather too, uh, we're, we're in really interesting land and there are people who can make uh, points to that. And there are some who are like, if the guy has a Cape, I'm done. Okay. You, you can do that, but I have to tell you that there's something happening in the culture right now where we have to look at that. And I also love that there's a look at it of like, well, you know what? This is really kind of like uh, uh, a militaristic background. You know, this is like a, a fascist state, all these superheroes. And they're trying to look at it from that side as well, like the mm -hmm. boys and stuff. The boys, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really brilliant to, to be going down that path. And uh, I, I mean, you're talking about some really cool things about this. And Jessica, uh, I, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation conversation as well, because uh, one of the things that you wrote that was really interesting to me, and I'm interested to see if it's going to be a series or not, or maybe I've missed the rest of it, but it's the, not your Stepford, uh, the monstrous mm -hmm. feminine. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because uh, my thing was uh, a lot of horror was for me to deal with childhood trauma and safely confront that shadow self. And it kind of felt like that's the dance that you were doing in there. Yeah. So for me, when it comes to horror, like having that passion, um, I find horror healing. So in the sense that I have a lot of childhood trauma, I have a lot of things, horrible, terrible things. And so when I watch horror movies, I feel the cathartic experience sometimes that I need to uh, get through something. It, you know, like I really liked how people talk about, they go to like their horror comfort movies to help them feel good. I do that too. I also go to some horror movies to help me get through something. Like I'm like, there is something going on that I need to emotionally and mentally deal with. This movie is going to trigger something and I'm going to work through this. And then that's where a lot of my writing comes from. So when I came out with the monstrous feminine I was like this is what I'm doing like I'm healing through horror but I'm engaging with this conversation and kind of like healing like the the feminine identity within the horror genre and my own identity within the horror genre so yeah I have a couple more pieces that will be coming out it just it took a little bit of a back burner because we were focusing on pride last month but this I have some pieces coming out as well but yeah I wanted to have those conversations about that yeah, that's uh, and you mentioned comfort uh, horror. Uh, I forgot, Kelly, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you. I don't think I did. Uh, I had read that you said something about comfort horror. So what is the comfort food of horror? What does that mean? Oh, so I, I got bless Satan, I guess, don't have <laughs> any trauma. I don't have all that kind of background as well, too. So I, I wouldn't say horror is a cathartic experience for me, um, but for me, comfort horror means if I want something that's like easily digested, familiar, comfortable in the sense of like, I just need something that I know inside and out due to like a long day at work. Cause I have a very emotional job as a vet tech. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there's something like that going on. Um, that's how I view comfort horror. Um, it's more the the comfort and the familiarity of it, right? And so for me, those are mo generally movies from my childhood. So Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Monster Squad, Elvira. Um, a new film that I've watched twice in the last couple of weeks is Psycho Gorman. Oh, I am yeah. obsessed yes. with that movie. That has <laughs> all of the makings of my childhood movies in a new, fresh way. And I am obsessed with it right now and I love it. So I go to those movies and through the pandemic, and that's been a trying time in many ways, especially for my job. I have watched Monster Squad and Nightmare on Elm Street 4. I couldn't tell you how many times, like so, so many times because they bring me such joy. If I'm feeling anxious about something or sad about something, or just, I just need that 
Russia familiarity of just like, yes, I need this and not something new. Because sometimes, you know, when it's new, you want to put your focus into Mm -hmm. giving like the movie the attention it deserves. And sometimes I don't fucking have that. I don't have that to give. (laughs) So I go to those movies. Um, Yeah. So there's the horror ones. Those are my main ones that I would normally go towards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I have house cleaning horror. I have things that I watch (laughs) that if I have uh, something that I know it's going to take about 90 minutes, you know, I'll I'll sit there and put on phantasm too. Uh, Or, or I have uh, an old Judas priest concert that I'll put on. (laughs) I know exactly when I'm going to get angry. And so I go over and I do the tile work at that point or whatever. So uh, what what I love about uh, your work uh, and that's talking about spinsters and and the podcast uh, is that it spans a wide array of horror styles. We talked about, you know, different loves and horror is so broad because it needs to be broad because we need to be able to have a definition that will hold everybody's spot of what they need for it. But uh, you guys uh, can discuss esoterics and classic horror movies. And then you go to the other extreme, right? And uh, then there's taboo terrors, right? So I think I know who the gore hound is here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is. So what, gore, uh, what is it about uh, gore? I guess what gore movie are you unashamedly a fan of? <laughs> oh, controversial. Um, <laughs> so I love my taboo terrors. Um, well, right now, let's keep it relevant and current. So I recently wrote something called uh, Cultural Extremism, a new subgenre, because it's fun making up subgenres, okay? <laughs> we can have fun with it. We it's a good a time. <laughs> yeah, I, it's really great. Like, whether they're, I'm not really serious about it, generally speaking, but it's fun, right? Like the... <laughs> what was it? The aquatic drama. Though that person may not have been super serious, I think that's hilarious and yes. that's great. Like I just love playing around with those terms when we're not pretentious about it. Um and so right now it's is um it is a s- hold on, give me a second. I'm trying to get the right Chile. There we go. So right now it's a Chilean movie called Trauma. Mm. And it is a spirit, I feel like a spiritual successor or spiritual twin to a Serbian film. Oh, but worse, somehow worse. And it's fascinating I- to me because it comes with Chilean historical political background. Oh, and I'm yep. really mm-hmm. into cultural extremism. Okay. I've it's, seen this. I, you've as seen soon, trauma? As soon, yep. The very beginning, it was enough for me. And I was like, holy yep. shit. Yep. I got yes. you. As soon as you yep. said, Chile, and then you said Serbian film. It's like I just kind of blacked it, blocked that out because that beginning is so rough. It yeah. is. And after that five minutes, I text a friend of mine immediately who loves extreme films as well. And I was like, and people think a Serbian film is bad. Again, it's all thresholds and perspectives and whatnot. And that's why my threshold is very, very high. But it's so well made, it has a really interesting premise and incredible acting and really disgusting characters. And so right now it's one of my like current favorite taboo terrors. An old classic that I love is Necromantic 1 and 2. Sure, of course. I I was going to say the one that uh, I love is The Untold Story. (gasps) Oh my God, I watched it for the first time recently, that uh, Category 3 film. Because Unearthed just released that like a brand new version of it, big like Blu-ray release. And that movie is super funny. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw it in the 90s. And, uh, oh, I, you know, it was back when I was like, oh, there's no horror anymore. Everything's psychological thriller. Mm-hmm. Everything's psychological yeah. thriller. And then uh, I had to go to Asia and, and, yeah. and uh, oh, yeah. South America to find good horror movies and the Asian extremes. Cat 3 films were really starting, you know, the 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 um oh my god american uh, the guinea pig movies not american the yeah. guinea pig movies were just coming out on video and stuff and and or on dvd at the time and it was yeah. just insane how there was this disparity between what was happening which is somewhat austere happening in the united states and this really crazy stuff what gore movie do you think gets unjustly hated like it's a really good damn movie but people can't get over whatever it is, or even oh. gore hounds are like, I hate that movie. You're like, no, you don't get it. Oh, oh, um, 
See, for me, I actually say it's not really a gore movie, but it's gory. Hostile, the original Hostile, mm. I think gets a, a bad rap. People look at it in the exact opposite of what I see, uh, mm. which is uh, I I see there's a reason that it was in a Soviet bloc country. Uh, I think the Americans are the ugly ones. It's about xenophobia, mm. but it's not promoting yeah. xenophobia. Uh, right. It is about xenophobia and it's about mm. industrial uh genocide basically because you have this yeah. country that it's set in is where the velvet revolution happened and basically uh the soviet union left that area of the world and we were supposed to help them and we were supposed to allow for all these tax breaks for industrialists to come and use their land and all of this and instead they just left dead factories they took all the money back to the united states and gave nothing to the people so it's i think it's the second to last most poverty stricken area and uh, Roth for whatever he does in his other films. That one, I think he was dead on because he used street kids uh, to remind you of what was real. And mm. to me, it was like, uh, yeah, that whole group, the bubblegum gang or whatever that was in that movie, those were all uh, uh, real street kids that he hired that were, were there to, and they save the one person who's worth saving in the end, but it's all about industrialists. It's not about mm. people just coming there. It's people yeah. on jets coming to that place to do this terrible thing yeah. where you're not going to have any kind of repercussions, which is basically what the governments did yeah. to that place. Yeah. And so I love that movie wow. for the, the, the nastiness of it, but also that I see this whole thing that people just immediately were repulsed in a way. And they went, well, that's, that's, that's just uh, xenophobic. And I'm like, no, no, mm -hmm. that's the opposite. You know, right. xenophobic is like every fucking falling down type film, you know, stuff like that yeah. xenophobic. This, this is not. Yeah. Oh, so I haven't rewatched Hostel in a very long time. And you just saying that right now makes me want to watch it again immediately. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot more to a lot of these quotes. And this is a tangent. I will not go on torture porn films. Um, I hate that that term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chair so porn, was, chair um, violence, chair movies. Yeah. And so they're all about chairs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chair I would say generally within like the extreme crowd they like a serbian film general horror audiences really revile and hate a serbian film but i look at a serbian film just like i look at trauma in the sense of there's a lot of politics and cultural context that you need to to keep in mind when you watch films from different countries that are vastly different from our yeah. own and i wrote all about that because it's so interesting i can't watch a Chilean film from a Canadian perspective and be like, wow, that's fucked up. You know, this is, this is just trash. This is just torture porn. So a movie that definitely isn't mainstream, but there is a director that I'm becoming like a huge fan of, and that's Lucifer Valentine. Uh, and he has his vomit gore vomit trilogy. Gore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even just hearing those words makes people very upset because yeah. they don't really know what they're in for. There are a good amount of people in the extreme community that don't like his films because they don't, I don't want to say don't get it because I feel like that seems pretentious. You know what I mean? Um, but I watched his first film in that trilogy called Slaughtered Vomit Dolls, bought it, and it is haunting. There is a lot more there than people are giving it credit for. Um, like the disintegration of this poor, like traumatized young woman who has gone to any kind of, you know, avenue that she possibly can to survive, you know, stripping, becoming a sex worker, drugs, bulimia, like it's like this whirlwind of emotions and interlaced with this, like, it's all kind of, it looks found footage ish. It's all like handheld kind of direction and, and camera work. And it kind of goes back and forth between like, the loss of her innocence as a child because there's images of her like in a video as a child talking about her dreams and aspirations as an adult. And then you learn in this trilogy that she has been sexually abused by um, a priest when she used to go to Sunday school. Like there is a very, there's a very layered situation in those, in those movies. But mm -hmm. if you don't give them the chance, you won't understand them. And that's why I've become a huge fan of his work because there's a lot going on there and he has a lot of different things to say, but at least it's not even him saying it. It's these characters and these people that are real in his movies that have stories to tell. And he just puts it together in this narrative style that people don't necessarily like, but the vomit plays a very large role in the film films, yep. which might be hard to watch if you're, you have a strong, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And I think that's uh, where people get shocked. Like that, that's why, why they can't get past it. They're just like, Oh no, I can't, I can't see past beyond that. And it's like, you're just saying like when people hear that name, like I just told someone the other day about that film and she's not a horror fan herself. But when I said, I'm like, you know, vomit girl trilogy doll. And she was like, Oh no, I could not watch that ever. You know, you know it's like, you know, and I try to explain more during, she's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm stopped. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and That's... so even fans of like extreme horror and a lot of, a lot of stuff don't like it. They're like, oh, it's just a bunch of vomiting. It's like, all right, if you want to see it and read it that way, that's totally fine. It's not for you. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but again, face value versus how about we look a little bit deeper in it? Yeah. I'm I'm laughing because I can just see Jess. You're you're going to a non horror <laughs> fan saying slaughtered vomit dolls, and it's like it's like when Toby Hooper was first coming up with the idea of Texas Chainsaw. He he got a friend on the phone who is a, a fellow liberal <laughs> mm -hmm. in uh, in Austin, and he said, uh, "Would you go see a movie called Head Cheese?" He's like, "No." I'm not going to see a movie called Head Cheese. He goes, well, how about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? And he goes, absolutely not. There is no way I would ever, never would I. And he gets more angry as he's even saying the words Texas Chainsaw mm. Massacre. And Toby said, yeah. oh, I know what I'm calling this thing. <laughs> yeah, this right away. Reaction it's, it's funny. Uh, I saw Valentine's one with uh, the guy who was walking around with the squid or the octopus. And he's sticking it in his mouth and throwing up yeah. on people's heads. And, yeah. uh, and I was like, like, yeah, it's interesting because it's going to go where I, I, I wanted to go next, because I look at that as uh, have you seen the bunny game? Not yet. No. Not yet. Yeah, watch the bunny game. That was one oh, that listen. really, really affected me. And it's black and white. Basically, yeah. the entire movie is in the back of a truck bed, uh, yeah. a, a, a an empty truck and uh, a video camera. One woman. A uh, bunny mask and this guy and someone trying to suffocate people. It's so traumatic. And then you realize when you're watching something's happening, there's like a somebody's pushing through and it happens to be the actress. And then you find out in real life that she had been abducted, abducted and she wanted this movie made. And there is a scene in there where she actually gets branded live on camera. Yeah. And I was like, wow, the trust you had to have and the, oh. the pain you had to exercise. Mm -hmm. And for some, that's that's real. Even for me in a certain mindset, I'm like, that's a lot to ask anybody. But there's also this thing of once we hit that level of transgression, something else happens. We're in a whole different place. And for me, the, the Valentine thing, which I'm I'm not personally a fan of, uh, but at the same point, I admire that he has somehow transcended a kink, right? He's been able to take fetish mm. and bring it into horror. And outside of like early uh, Cl uh, Clive Barker, uh, most horror movies are not sex and violence. They're nudity and violence. They're, mm. the, the sex is very, very simple. And uh, the idea of going down the path uh, where we're starting to go into the darkness of fetish is of interest to me. And I think it, it, show, it gets me and other people uncomfortable depending upon what you're deciding to show. And that's where horror is supposed to take us. Why are we going at the place that we are the most fragile and vulnerable and not going there? It's obvious yep. that sex and gender and all of this stuff is so much a galvanizing thing for us as a, a culture, a world culture, that horror may be the place that we can break that open. So what I saw with uh, Valentine was here's a guy who's got, uh, you know, toilet, uh, he's got a, a, a toilet fetish and the vomiting part is very big, but he's not just going, oh, well, I'm going to get an easy one out. He, he finds a way to bring that into a communication device. And he's, as you mentioned, he's talking about somebody else's trauma in this character. And that's what makes the bunny game, right? Bunny game is that this is all trauma and we're seeing someone kind of breaking through until the end, which is really, really disturbing. But uh, the, the idea of what uh, Valentine's doing, I can give him props for what he's attempting. I'm waiting to see who is going to find the way that we can grab both ends of that and make it so that people can watch it. Uh, 
Like mm-hmm. there's only some yeah. people are going to be able to watch slaughtered vomit dolls. I mean, even yeah. the, the covers are drawn like with crayon and things. So yeah. I think he's in, uh, in trouble. Nobody knows even who he is. The main actress died, I believe. I think she may have yep. committed suicide. So there's no, all she this. died in a car accident. In a car accident. Okay, good. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff that's being said on the, on the web. Yeah, so totally. it's really tough when you do something and you take that risk and you go outside of what people are, are allowed to be scared of, then it becomes really hard uh, to get a, a good reputation. So I'm waiting to see who can do that. And I think where I wanted to go with this is I think there's a Venn diagram of folks that I get along with or people that I meet <laughs> at film festivals, the people who get obsessed, that Venn diagram, uh, they're really into horror. So the big circle is that. But then there's other sides. There's the heavy metal or punk overlap on one piece. Then there's the body modification or tattoo overlap. And then there's the, uh, the, the, I read everything, especially yeah. if it ends up not being fiction, I will read more nonfiction than I will fiction. And then there's sometimes a, a fetish or kink overlap. All these things I think are, if you look at them from a, a, a perspective of view away, they're all kind of parts of ritual. Every one of them has a thing that, yes, you may be connected on the mind side, but it's actually scratching some kind of almost physical and spiritual uh, itch. I think that uh, when I would go to uh, heavy metal shows long before there were mosh pits, when everybody just stood in the front and went like this Mm -hmm. and banged their heads and just sweat on top of each other, sweat, sweat, sweat. That was a ritual. We were ripping something out of us that we could not uh, really speak of. And uh, I know that uh, you folks mentioned heavy metal in your description. So what does heavy metal, if you are the heavy metal person or the punk person, bring to the equation for you? I'll let Jess answer this one. Oh gosh. Heavy metal lets me get express myself. Um, <clears throat> it allows me to, <sighs> I always keep going back to this word cathartic because that's what metal and horror are cathartic for me. I, get a lot of emotion out of it. I get a lot of feeling, I get inspiration out of it. And I just, I want to, I want to just be surrounded by it all the time. And I just feel good. I feel myself. I feel like I have my identity and I can feel like I can express myself fully to people. So when like, I'm talking about various different, like when I have my various metal moods, I'm like, "Mm, I'm in the, I'm, I'm kind of in a depressive mode type thing. I'm listening to a lot of like atmospheric black metal right now that I'll jump up into like power metal when I'm feeling really good about things. But, and I do the same thing with horror movies, you know, to help me work through the different things that I'm going through and understand, you know, not just more about myself, but also about the world. Because one of the things I love about both horror metal is that they give you the truth to your face. Like, this is it. This is, there's no making things pretty for you. It's no like pink and white and, you know, lovely, like, you know, uh, I, I really don't like rom-coms, so like romantic <laughs> comedies, right? It, this is the truth. This is what we, it, but this, and this is where I love like metal and horror music and horror movies can do that. They can bring that both out. And it's like, now feel uncomfortable and figure out how you guys want to deal with this. Are you going to embrace it and work with it? Or are you going to shove it off to the side and be like, no, this doesn't exist. I don't want to deal with this side. Right. And that's where that comes from for me. That's great. See, uh, I'm, uh, I'm kind of in a, a, a dark pagan music right now. That's mm. my thing. Where Druna is probably the most popular of them all, but yeah. it's kind of like for me, <laughs> dread horror movies is like <sighs> dark pagan music. They both have the same. It's kind of <laughs> just this baseline of dread going through them. That's just like, for some reason, that makes me happy. That's that's <laughs> a, a, a jar of posies for me. Is, is the more atmospheric the music in the movie for me, the, the more I'm in my zone. I'm just like, I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that brings me into, uh, I think, what I, I wanted to talk about uh, now, which is uh, something I think is also close to the hearts of you, uh, is folk horror. Uh, the idea that uh, there is this weird connection, like an atmosphere. I listen to uh, dark pagan music, Viking music when I go out in the mm. woods sometimes. And it's like, oh, yeah, at any yeah. moment, Odin's going to take my eye. Here we go. <laughs> And you know, something crazy is going to happen. But uh, uh, for me, it's uh, really interesting that you had a folk horror month uh, just recently, right? And I'm a, did you guys get to see the, the documentary by Carla Janess yet? Not yet. Oh. Not yet, sadly. Yeah, Woodlands sadly. Dark and Days Bewitched. Uh, oh. I highly, highly recommend it because uh, if you liked, have you read House of Psychotic Women? 
uh, yeah. careless. There okay. So my, uh, the book that I did screaming for pleasure, it's almost like they should be companion pieces in the, the idea that it's personal experiences mm -hmm. and how hard kind of worked in their lot and our lives. And yeah. I won't say that she does that in this, but if you like how deep divey she gets in her book and in the, in the essay book, Satanic Panic, Woodlands Dark and Days Bewitched, three hours. And in the first I'm half an hour, she's done everything that most people consider as folk horror. And she goes, now we're going to kick the door in on this patriarchal white guy from England idea of what folk horror is. And we're going to look at the rest of the world. Nice. And it was awesome. like, it was so fantastic. Yeah. So she breaks the doors down immediately and gives really, really strong points for everything. And, and what I love about it, and I, I hope I can get her on, but uh, what I love about it is that she um, basically allows talking heads to give viewpoints, which then other talking heads will argue. She doesn't, mm -hmm. it's, it's like true documentary. So many documentaries now just kind of omit the other side or just yeah, show mm -hmm. certain pieces mm -hmm. this allows for this kind of mercurial definite what is full car at the end at one point i was like frustrated i'm going everything's full car fine <laughs> everything and, and it's like, right. oh, yeah and so yeah. it's like how could it yeah. not be right and yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, yeah like i'm sure in ontario there is a folk <laughs> story that is full car that uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there is. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's just, it's part of our storytelling. It's part of mm -hmm. horror that I think is so big. But one of the things that I thought was really fascinating that I wanted to see about talking about with you was uh, there's, a, she makes a connection between women's suffrage, the women's suffrage moment, movement, and the increase in spiritualism at the time. The idea of witchcraft becoming yes. kind of mainstream. And that one of, one of the people says, well, of course, we weren't allowed to be priests. What did you think was going to happen? And so I, I'm intrigued by that. I was thinking, I, I wanted to see what uh, your thoughts are on that, the idea of like alternate religions or uh, the idea of gaining power when you're not able to get power. And that maybe that's one of the draws of full car because it's not an institution, right? It's almost like full car to me is like, it's, it's bleeding up from the roots. You can't contain it. Right. Oh, this is a Jess question. There's Jess written all over it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm just, just sitting there being like gaining power. Well, huh. well, when I when I look at folk horror and stuff like that, when we think of like the the, the foundation of organized religions, the their foundation is essentially they stole from mm -hmm. Folk, like, like from folk religions, from pagans, from the, you know, Wiccans, like all these elements in these other structured religions all still existed. And, but they were taken away. It was like almost like taken away, depossessed, and then made to look evil, right? Um, and so we're constantly looking at folk horror and this is constant like demonization of it. But yeah, at the same time, too, I'm like, well, it was here first, right? Like we believe these ideas prior to you telling us that this is now wrong and this is inappropriate. And so I, and I feel like alternate beliefs and spiritualities has always existed, right? No one's ever going to believe like one solid idea, right? Until we get, and then you get organized religion coming in and say, no, no, you need to have to believe one solid idea because if you don't believe one solid idea, we can't have power over you. Whereas I like in folk horror is that there's like a communal power and it's all shared and it's all connected. And and when it's that way, it's a, it feels to me like a more powerful force. But in horror movies, it's in the, or where we see it, it's seen as a threatening force, right? Because it's everything that's not the structured religion or what the structured patriarchy or the structured role, right? And then so when it comes to women, right? In religion, it is to patriarchy. It is men. They, they they hold this power and they took all this other way from women. Like, you know, the idea of medicine, the idea of healing the sick, you know, tending to the illness. Like it was all taken from women and taken and appropriated by men in religion and particularly religious organizations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, David Edgars talks about that a lot in the documentary. Mm -hmm. He talks about why there were certain things that were in the witch and they talked to a few folks who are uh, Satanists and like, Oh, he brought in things that we were like cheering. You don't yeah. see that stuff. Uh, th this is some of the great old wive tales about witchery that never makes it into films, the grinding of the baby and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he's like, this, this really makes the connection so strong. And I think mm -hmm. that that's, uh, that's great. And I think we're on to something now where, you know, um, Earth Day was about when 
you know, 1970, there's Earth Day, and that's about when we start getting full car. We start getting the, the hippies moving out of the cities and everything and going out there trying to yeah. live off the land. And so there is yeah. this, uh, this interesting connection, and I think we're seeing it now. I think there's more uh, especially out of Ireland, there's a bunch of films that I consider full car that have come out that have truly excited me. And uh, I've, I, I wrote as much as I've watched horror films over the decades. I have a list like this of movies I'd never seen from that documentary. Yeah. I was like, this is incredible. And, and there's some stuff in there that just blew my mind. Uh, I guess um, what is it about full car we're, we're kind of talking about a whole bunch of different things but what is it about it that makes you really excited because you had a month of it that's i've never heard yeah. anybody say we're going to have a month of full car so uh kelly what's your answer oh um briefly i'll say is that when we first started this project we're like let's do each month we're going to do a theme and what's amazing about it one aspect of it that i love is that it kind of informs my watching for the month because <laughs> there's so much content right so i'm like mm -hmm. okay well, this month is this. So let's say we are doing a folk horror month. So I'm going to just predominantly watch folk horror and, you know, watch things I've never seen before. And it's such a great time. Like the podcast, we usually cover like two movies. So there's so much more that we could look into. And also we record at the end of the month. So it's great because then we immerse ourselves in the world of folk horror. We're researching, we're reading all these different articles and these different essays, watching these movies. So when we come together, to talk about our theme and our movies, I feel like now we're like these experts. By the end of the month, we're like, yes, <laughs> we know so much about folk horror. And I know for me, because it was a genre that like I knew about and I liked, mm. I, I end up liking so many of the movies that are in it, but there were still a bunch that I hadn't seen. And I am now like an absolute convert and absolute lover and super fan of folk horror. Um, I love the diversity that is in folk horror. I love that so much of it comes down to human beings and our relationships between one another, our relationship with nature. And as, you know, as a vegan, we're both vegans. Like, you know, I love that the second wave of folk horror is happening. Maybe it's because, hello, climate change. Right. Shit is getting real out there. And maybe that's why we're seeing the second wave of like this interest in folk horror and going back to our roots, like going back to nature, going back to rural landscapes and small communities and more living off the land than the crap that we're doing right now to the world. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that about folk horror. And, you know, during the research for it, I love how smart it is. I love how intricate it is. I love how detailed it is. And like every movie, whether it's supernatural, like heavy on the supernatural or not. So like if we're blood of blood on Satan's claw, the witch, the ritual, love that. But then I watched this movie for the first time called Caliber. Oh, yes. Holy moly. Mm -hmm. Not supernatural whatsoever. It's just interrelationships between human beings yeah. and oh my God, like I keep shouting that movie from the rooftops because I fell in love with it and it's folk horror. And it's such an incredibly diverse, interesting, powerful subgenre. So mm -hmm. I was like in, immersed in it all month and then just gave it our, gave it my all in, in, in the podcast, but I fell in love with it so much during that month. Yeah. yeah. And I was already a fan of folk horror from the get go. Like I, when I first really got into the horror genre, it was actually folk horror that kind of drew me in because I love films from like the 1970s. And some of my favorite films were like, I saw uh, the witch finder general. And then mm -hmm. I saw the wicker man. The wicker man is one of my favorite films. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I saw blood and Saints Claus. So I saw like all the classics and I'm like, Oh, this is like, I love atmosphere. I love cinematography. I love anything to do with landscape and how like isolated <laughs> people can be and yeah. just, how you're dependent on the land and you know, when you need to have a relationship with it. I love, I love this idea of like, you can have a group of people who are together and they have these beliefs and how it could go either really positively or could go in a really super scary, dangerous way, you know, and going to that, you know, where we talked about communes versus cults and how, mm -hmm. you know, how to tell the difference of, of them and just, and often, this happens often a lot of folk art. it goes back to witchcraft and obviously as a witch i'm very um interested in the history of you know witches throughout the world and our you know presence within um folklore and all the ideas about that come out about women from the the idea of the witch right so of course like films like the witch and hagazusa i was just like oh yeah 
these films I love, I need to keep, I love these films. I love just, and, you know, the, the messages that come out of it. Cause I, I like to watch these films and even if they're really quiet and they don't do too much and you're just seeing these beautiful landscapes and they just really picturesque scenes and they just this atmosphere, but you can see the emotion too. And like, I feel like there's a lot of emotion in these films as well because yeah. things are happening that they don't understand. Even if it's not supernatural, like I was thinking, you know, like when we did, apostle and the wicker man like the apostle has so much interrelationship going on but it also has a supernatural element whereas the wicker man it's all interpersonal relationships and right. there's no supernatural in there and you're just like what is happening <laughs> right and yet that's the one people think is supernatural that's what's funny mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and depending mm -hmm. upon who you are it's a happy ending <laughs> yeah and so, <laughs> so, so yes exactly yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a really interesting look at, and they, they really go at the wicker man. I mean, in a good way and in a way mm -hmm. that I had never mm -hmm. looked at it before. They were kind of looking at uh, the idea of class in that film as well. Oh yes. That they're very rich, you know, uh, yep. summer Isle is rich, you know, he's able yeah. to do all this stuff and he's eating the poor by, by setting fire to this constable at the end. So it's a really, I never even thought of it in those terms. So it was kind right. of interesting to, to look at it in that fashion, but have you seen without name? No, I have not. Oh, no, well, not if you, yet. No. So that double feature that with picnic at hanging rock, which I also believe I is really, full car. I want to see that. Yeah, it is up. Yeah. No, that's up there. I've yeah. Seen. Those two really work together because uh, I've been a full car person long before I even knew it was a full car thing. I think if you are in a deeply religious thing, you're already in yes. full car. You just don't yeah. know it. And so for me, uh, I, uh, my first love, uh, as a writer was Algernon Blackwood. I stole a book when I was a kid out of the library and it was, a uh, Alfred Hitchcock presents kind of thing with all these mm -hmm. stories. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. had the Wendigo, uh, Algernon oh, Blackwood was okay. the Wendigo. Yeah. And he also did one called The Willows, which is just about okay. two guys in a, on a, going down the Danube and they start going deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden the laws of physics aren't working anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's, and that's as far as, I mean, they never, it's all weird stories. And he, uh, he was one of the people who influenced HP Lovecraft to start going okay. his yeah. MR James, as well as another folk who, who did a lot of ghost stories. But I, uh, my thing was, uh, I was, uh, I was in an abusive life. And I ran to the woods. I was in Pennsylvania. I was in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. Mm. So I just ran out there and that's where I stayed. So, uh, you know, surprise turning into a heavy metal druid by the time <laughs> I get this old, but that was the thing I hid in the woods and yeah. I was, I was surrounded by hunters and hunters and firefighters are pagans and they don't know it. <laughs> they believe all, but if you tell them, they'll gut you alive. But at the same point, they, they believe that fire is an entity uh, that is uh, dangerous. And the belief of the land that a real hunter, not a guy, a Yahoo that goes out and gets drunk and shoots himself in the face, the real hunters that go and take yeah. their clothes and dig them in, uh, dig a hole and put them in there for a couple months so that they have the smell of the land while they're out there. Guys that go out there with one bullet because they're really out there to commune with mm. nature. You know, those are the folks that I grew up with. And it was, uh, I learned a lot about about what they thought the woods meant and how much fear there is. One of the things that's great in the documentary is they talk to First Nation folks and they're saying, you know, if I hear Indian burial ground, I know you don't know what you're talking about. There is no such thing as Indian burial ground. There's there's Cree, there's Blackfoot, Ooh. there's a, Indian burial ground. What is that? Ooh. And so uh, he says that all the horror movies, the folk horror that comes out is colonists colonialists yes. who are afraid of being colonized yes the great fears yes. it's all going to get taken away and so that's the full car that i learned when i was hearing quote unquote we respect uh, the the indians on pennsylvania land yeah right but they knew all about it because they're fascinated with the foe right mm -hmm. And what's going to happen when the earth always talking about cutting down too many trees and there's a great one have you seen the hollow the hollow H A L L O W. No, oh my goodness. It's an Irish film. I love it. It is a real monster movie, but it's all about what we're doing to the ecology in Ireland. It's all about logging yeah. in Ireland mm -hmm. and the, uh, the idea of the, uh, oh my goodness, what is the zombie disease that it was in ants? There was this wasp that would get into, uh, would implant this uh, bacteria into okay. an ant and it would take over the ant oh, and it would go yeah. into the colony. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. So it's bacterial. 
Yeah. And they talk about how cutting away the trees, what's going to stop those bacteria that are deep yes. in there, right? Yeah. And so the horror movie is ecological. Yeah. And yet mm-hmm. it's also full of trolls and elves and all this stuff yeah. that Ooh, is yeah. in cool. Ireland. So it's 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 fucking awesome. So I love how my big thing is I love L- allegory and metaphor. What yeah. is that? Why why are we going here? And I love when we bring the monster back in because the monster is the forgotten metaphor. Mm-hmm. Monster meant something when the monster was first there. And then yeah. he became a model kit that you could get in Kmart. And when that happened, we forgot about the metaphor. And yeah. now the metaphor is coming back. And I, yeah. I think I think these things can't die. I think these old stories continue to come up. And I know I'm taking up, uh, we're past the hour mark. So I apologize if I've taken too much of your time. We can see about wrapping this up. No, I think we're, I think, I don't know, for me, we're, I think we're doing well. I don't know if there's anything else to talk about with regards to, to folk horror, but Scott, if you have any more questions or anything related to that, I mean, that's up to you. I'm, I'm doing okay here. I don't stop. I don't stop. So <laughs> this is the issue. That's why you have a podcast. Yes. Yeah. So uh, let, let's talk, uh, we don't have to keep it down to uh, uh, folk horror, but let's just talk about horror movies in general. You're both passionate you're doing research. You have a podcast. You also have a, a uh, you have a website that has pages and pages of different blog ideas. So what horror movie do you champion or do you want to champion that doesn't get the love that you think it should? What's, what's the ugly duckling in both of your lives? My usual go-to, and I should probably update this, but whatever. Um, my usual go-to is Stakeland, um, <laughs> directed by Jim Mickle, because I love his work, yeah. especially when he, you know, collaborates with Nick DiMici, um, mm-hmm. who stars in it. I, I love that team. Also, side note, I just finished watching Sweet Tooth on Netflix. Thank you, Jim yeah. Mickle, for bringing a beloved comic series to life. Um I love Stakeland a lot. Um, again, maybe I'll update this at one point, but this is one because nobody talks about Stakeland and it's a really wonderful vampire movie um, that takes, it goes to different places than other vampire films do. Like the vampires are monsters in this and very rarely do you get monstrous vampires mm-hmm. or, you know, if you do, it's daybreakers and a lot of people don't like that one and it just kind of takes it to different places. But John I, I Carpenter's like my... Vampires is another Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's, I, I love Stakeland. It's this, this great little indie film that nobody talks about really interesting, like religious ideas in that. Um, it's just like a very heartwarming, fantastic movie. Daniel Harris is in it as well. And it's that one. Nobody talks about that. I think people should. And now I guess we'll come back to caliber when we were, you know, folk horror month, but Holy moly. Yeah. I don't, again, when you're a horror movie fan for so long, it's sometimes hard to be surprised by something or like shocked. We are like, Oh, wow, that just happened. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. And that happened yeah. in caliber. So for me, I'm just like, Oh yeah, no, that just keeps coming top of mind because after watching so, so many movies, especially during the pandemic, because that's the time that we've had, I've had, <laughs> um, so I'll say those two movies that uh, kind of come top of mind right now. Stakeland is an age old, like classic that nobody talks about. Classic as in my classic recommendation for me. And then Caliber, I think it's a French film. And it, um, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic directing and acting and cinematography. And it's fantastic. Yeah. Mind blowing, disturbing. Uh, yeah. Eden Lake reminds me of that. The, oh. the feeling that I had. Yeah. That was a good one. Well, yes. Yeah. I, I, we have a list of movies, a friend of mine and myself of movies to blow your brains out over. <laughs> that's, that's on that list. There's these movies that you go, ah, that was uh, a gut punch. Why did I? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so that, yeah, that's, that's great. I, I love that you bring up Stakeland. Uh, I, one of the things that was a lifesaver for me in really wanting to get back into looking at horror movies the way that I do was the glass eye picks, everything that was coming out of the glass mm-hmm. eye picks group. And so Mikkel is a disciple of, uh, of glass eye picks. And I remember watching his earlier ones. And when I saw Stakeland, I was like, oh, this is a Pennsylvania boy. You can feel <laughs> the, the tri state on that movie. Yeah. And, and it's just, it's a wonderfully overly ambitious film. 
you know, here's a movie yeah. that is made for pennies and it's yeah. trying to do, you know, the passage, Justin Cronin's the passage, that book. And I'm going, wow, the huge scope scale. Kelly McGillis gets a career again. Right. From that film. Yes. Oh, and, yes. And she's fantastic yep. in a couple movies yep. that she does for those folks. I mean, uh, that, those are really good picks. So, okay, Jess looks like, uh, uh, how, where are we going to go now? <laughs> I, oh my goodness. I'm so bad at championing things. Um, I, if I really were to think of the film that really made me decide that I want to have conversations about horror movies and Kelly is going to roll her eyes. It was the void. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that was the film that I decided I wanted to do a podcast. And it was because I had seen it in theaters and I was just like, because it is known that I am a fan of um, Lovecraftian type horror or cosmic horror, as I like to mm -hmm. term it now, because, you know, knowing uh, right. history and his problem being problematic. I, but I've always been a fan of cosmic horror. And then when I saw The Void, I was like, what is this film? And I just loved it from the practical effects, the acting, the score, the, Im you know, the imagery, the throwbacks to like, you know, Clive Barker and the John Carpenter was the thing. And I just, and I wanted to have the conversation because I was like trying to describe what cosmic, I remember trying to describe cosmic horror to Kelly. I'm like, it is cosmic horror. And she's like, I don't get it. <laughs> like, you know, but we don't. I do she now. She does now. <laughs> she does an episode yeah. on cosmic horror. But that was the film that I, it was like the one that was like this, I want to talk horror to people. I want to have these conversations. And so that's the one I kind of, I champion that way. Cause I'm just like, I just think this is a good, it also is a good film. And also I really like Steve uh, Kos Kosostansky. Um, yep. As an individual, I fangirled when I met him at Horrorama a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, we just, were like, Jess, have you met Steve? And she's like, uh. <laughs> we're like, hey, bye. Good luck. <laughs> fangirling out. Good luck. And, and, he was like, and he was just so approachable and so nice. And like <laughs> having conversations sweet. about like horror movies and cosmic horror and stuff like that, you know. And so it's like and seeing Psycho Gorman was like, you know, seeing that love. And I think that's what I love about a lot of the horror movies that I am drawn to is I see the love that goes into and that's like one of my comfort horror films is the evil <laughs> dead the uh -huh. whole franchise and because uh, one of the reasons why is because i know the history i know like their story behind creating those films and i love that so i love the heart and i love the intention and the emotion that goes into it because like as you say horror is an emotion so when people put emotion into their films it comes it comes out to me that way yeah intention is such a huge piece to this mm -hmm. stuff i was talking with someone today who was having issues with uh, a group that they were with and i said you know the, the thing is we don't really have a problem with uh horror we don't have a problem with religion we have a problem with intention where are you taking it the original ideas of all of this are pure but what is it that people do with the intention and intentions are the things that usually uh, muck us up but yeah. intentions are also what we go to so many of us will champion a movie that say a giallo film and say, well, you have to understand it's dream logic and it's Italian and we're, we'll do all of that, but we won't understand when it's an American film that tries to do that. And like, ah, that movie just makes no sense. It's like, why can't you put the same? We have a, a desire for the intentions of what the filmmaker was doing. Is it sloppy or is it that the person just didn't have the money to be able to do it? And, you know, uh, it's like Fulci. You watch mm -hmm. Fulci films and some of the dubbing that's in Fulci films, you're like, oh my God. It totally derails the movie. And, and, and you're like, you got to be kidding me. No child sounds like that. And, and, you know, you have all these crazy things that happen, but we don't kill the movie because we see the intention. Yeah. It catches us in some way. It's a part of grabbing hold of that brass ring of emotion that we're all trying to get. And I love that, you know, uh, both of you champion films that their, their reach uh, out, uh, what was that called? The gra their grasp can't get to where the reach is. I can't think of the term, but basically <laughs> they overshoot, right? And yeah. they don't, and they don't give a shit. They're like, okay, people are going to see some of the scotch tape. It doesn't matter. I mean, the void is like the special effects in that movie. They needed another hundred million <laughs> to get that to where it's like, wow. But you give them the thing of, I get what they're doing here. I see the structure of what's happening. And I love the idea that this fellow had, small amounts of money, like catering mm -hmm. money on another film. And he yeah. said, I'm not going to make a small movie where it's three people in a room. I'm going to make a movie where it's end of the world and there's a whole hospital falling apart and people are on yeah. fire outside and stuff. And I think that that's just amazing. And I think it's yeah. fun too, that Astron 6 is kind of like Glass Eye 2. Mm -hmm. 
or I guess it could be Canadian glass eye. I yeah. guess. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. Yes. Yeah. Canadians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's wonderful that these are the movies that we champion. We champion the ones that we feel uh, are the misfits like we're the misfits. They, 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 they kind of have a lot going for them, but there's just a certain thing that the mainstream is going to go, oh, yeah, we can pass on that. Yeah. And, and that is where we tend to, at least that's where I find myself going a lot. And I love that uh, the voice. So you don't like the void, Kelly? Is that why the eye roll? Not really. <laughs> no. Yeah. We did a whole spinster versus spinster mini uh, episode on it. Our fun little like debate uh, show that we do. No, I didn't really like the void. No, It's what? very fine. <laughs> yeah. What, what, yeah. When I, when I first saw it, I was kind of focused on how much it was reminding me of movies like Hellraiser. Yes. It was reminding me of, <laughs> of the thing. And I remember a friend of mine nearly coming to blows with me in the car as we were driving to a convention. He's like, you know, you're such an asshole. If you'd have found <laughs> that movie and nobody had told you to watch it, you'd have been championing it like crazy. But because a bunch of us are like, oh, oh my God, have you seen the void, this low budget movie with the big heart? You're like, yeah, it reminds me a little bit too much of this oh, it has a little bit too much of that yeah. and, and so they called me on it and yeah. uh, i watched it again and i was like oh no i get uh, i i get what it is now i've got like a void t-shirt somebody made for me and stuff. <laughs> like, you know, it, it's it's funny how it goes sometimes you know i was yeah. all into yeah. the editor i was all into uh father's day which uh, mm-hmm. is yeah. one of the funniest yeah. damn things uh, yeah. so man born pg like yeah. i love so much of the other stuff that they have done and, and steve has done and it's fine you know it's uh (laughs) I love having like little friendly debates you know Mm -hmm. I can I can see yeah the heart and soul that went into and then goes into all of the movies that they create and Steve Kostansky creates I appreciate and respect them to the day I die for sure like I said Mm -hmm. I've been re-watching Psycho Gorman because that's kind of the feeling that I get from that movie that Jess got from The Void um Uh, I I love Psycho Gorman and I know it's, it's almost too cute for some, uh, but I, I, I even love the ridiculous special effects in that. I mean, Uh, the, the, the the aliens, the guy with the the teeth and the eyes, it's like, it's just so absurd. And you know, they know that it's absurd. So how can you get upset over something that knows what it is? You know, but I want to meet him. There's no, the last thing I'll say about that is that there is no pretension with what those people create. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately those are the people that are creating wonderful universes and delightfully unique and fun, entertaining, important and powerful movies but there you have Ari Aster and everybody is, you know, helming him as the great, the next greatest thing. Just say. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, it's, it's a tough, I want to embrace both of them. I, I yes, want to, I want to sure. invite Ari back into the fold when he's ready, when he's, yeah. when, he, right? when he's done playing in the big boy pants, he can come back. That's the thing. Yeah. Horror yeah. is always there. It is there taking your slings and arrows, but it is there when you yeah. need it. And it will yeah. be there for him. It came yeah. back for for uh, someone like Friedkin, who yeah. uh, spent all this time making other types of movies, and then walked right back into it and yeah. did Bug, which is a masterpiece. If you, if you haven't seen Bug, man, that is awesome. But uh, anyway, uh, I know I've kept you. So if you wanted listeners that are on here today uh, to get one thing out of your podcast, your show, uh, your your website, or this interview. Uh, what would you hope that it would be? Oh, that I would say that uh, horror is for everyone. And like you have said before, Scott, that there is something for everyone out there, whether it be you want a deeply emotional, impactful, atmospheric film, or do you want something that is very abrasive and harsh and extreme, yet also powerful? Do you want something lighthearted? but also powerful. The common theme here is that there is power in all types of horror. And I think as our project shows and what I spit in our podcast shows is exactly that. We'll show you the power of folk horror. We'll show you the power of horror icons like Elvira, you know, the importance of representation, like, you know, when we celebrate pride and we kind of helm and champion another indie filmmaker with his fantastic film bit. So that's kind of our mission statement was, you know, we want to elevate 
and showcase, you know, female horror fans and encourage those to, to speak out and vocalize their and express their fandom, but also be inclusive to everyone because horror in the end is for everyone. Yeah. And, and I'll just put in my two cents for there. It's just like, and also show other people in the mainstream or people who are just like, "Mm, I really like you're saying that horror doesn't deserve your shame. Showing people that horror is, has a lot to say. There is a, you know, if you can get past, you know, the, the naked woman running through the woods and stuff like that being chased by a chainsaw and think about why that film came out at that time and what is it trying to say? That's, that's what I would like to get to people. It's just like, don't, don't, don't hate on horror just because it makes you feel uncomfortable. Engage with it. Maybe open up, you know, and even if it's not for you, that's fine, but don't hate on it because there's no reason to. That's right. And you heard it, folks. Go out and see Bit. And uh, do you have another one to throw in there, Jessica? Bit. I will just tell you and go see Bit. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. So I, I want to thank you both for being on the show. Are you folks doing any live appearances this year? Is there anything coming up? Oh, boy. The pandemic is still you know, dampening any kind of live anything, unfortunately. I'm um, so we're just going to keep doing what we're doing online, our podcast and, and writing and stuff like that. We normally, you know, go to Horrorama here in Toronto, a horror convention, Canada's only horror convention. And, you know, they haven't announced anything, but again, it's pandemic. So it's very unfortunate that we won't be together live to do something. Um, but I will say I'm currently organizing a day of extreme horror talks. It's a virtual event on Saturday, July 31st. I hope I have to finalize some logistics, but there'll be a bunch of, t- there'll be three talks about the generally, let's say the extreme horror world, extreme uh, cinema world, but all brought to you by women and female identifying folks. So academics, podcasters, writers, researchers, fans of that. So it'll be Kelly's Taboo Tears, Visceral Pleasure, and Extreme Cinema happening at the end of the month. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Sounds really good. Where where can folks find you? Uh, I spit on your podcast and the Spencers of Horror. Go, Jess. Uh, people can find us on Twitter at Spinsters of Horror and, or sorry, is it at Twitter at Horror Spinsters? It's at Spinsters of Horror. Sorry. Oh, sorry. it's at Horror Spinsters. <laughs> what we'll have a posted, folks. Yeah. Yeah. So people can find us on Twitter at Horror Spinsters, on Instagram at Spinsters of Horror, and also on Facebook, Spinsters of Horror. And then- you'll find yeah. us through our Spinsters of Horror channels. Absolutely. Um, and if we didn't make it clear enough throughout this, We're celebrating our three-year anniversary, folks, and we want to say thank you to everyone that's been there with us from the beginning in 2018. We have grown a hell of a lot, and we've learned a hell of a lot, and so we hope you continue supporting us as the next three, four, five, ten years, and more, and beyond (laughs) goes on. Yes. Well, once again, thank you so much for being on. That's my thank guests, you. the spinsters of horror. And I want to thank you out there for listening to Hellbent for Horror, where I'm here to remind you that you used to love horror films and you secretly still do. And just remember to stay hellbent. And thanks for listening to the show. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can find more on our website, hellbentforhorror.com, and I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash hellbentforhorror, and my Twitter handle is hellbenthorror. Please hit that subscribe button to get H4H hot off the press. And if you can do a review on iTunes or whatever app you listen to us on, that really helps people get to find us. And now for some Hellbent for Horror news. The podcast is available on some more outlets now, so you can listen to H4H on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio, as well as the regular iTunes, Android, and Amazon apps. And let there be swag. H4H t-shirts are now on sale. We have a store on tpublic.com with a bunch of Hellbent for Horror designs, and you can have your choice of t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, something horrible beautiful for you or that's someone special. The link to the merchandise store is on our website, hellbentforhorror.com. And until we meet again, stay hellbent.